Thank you all. I, I, uh, I'm delighted to get to, to chat with you and, and hear your comments on the presentation. Uh, when I began the exercise of considering uh, what have we learned about hydraulic fracturing of unconventional shales over the past two decades, Mark Pearson, uh, who's uh, with Liberty Resources, he suggested to me that would be a daunting task. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. We've learned a lot, really a lot from the hundreds of thousands of wells fractured, the thousands of papers and presentations from laboratory tests and, and more recently from field post-fracture observations. And we're continuing to develop new tools and techniques that give more information. And from these measurements and field results, we're continuing to learn. We have indeed learned a lot. However, I have to admit that in some cases, what I found was what Dr. Alex Chu once told me, the more we know, the more we know that we don't know. Hydraulic fracturing, or often simply fracking for the layperson, is a subject of much attention. Industry is continuing to make advances, while some are suggesting fracking should be banned. Even though fracking is essential for unconventional shale oil and gas production. Hydraulic fracturing is important, really important, whether focusing on improvements or believing that fracturing should be banned. It's really important. All the information is daunting just to assemble, let alone to understand what each piece is telling. But maybe the most difficult is the interactions occurring during hydraulic fracturing. The effects are coupled with one process affecting another in a dynamic manner. And frankly, this coupling of effects may often not be understood or may be overlooked. This is one observation that I noted. Often the interactions of one thing with another are not fully or correctly considered. And consider what we have learned overall, what immediately does jump out are the incredible efficiency improvements in actual operations that have been achieved and continue to be made. Vertical wells are regularly drilled one or two miles deep and then horizontally drilled maybe two miles or maybe even close to three miles, all in days, not many weeks. Fracking includes regularly pumping at pressure upwards of 10,000 PSI 20 million gallons of water and 20 million pounds of sand or ceramics into the horizontal segment of a single well. I think what the oil and gas industry has achieved is really spectacular. With the huge amount of information available and the great importance of fracking broadly and objectively asking, what have we learned really seems most appropriate. This brief overview today addresses one perspective, it's mine, considering critical observations from calculations, laboratory experiments, and most of all, actual field experience. I note though that no one presentation can begin to define all that we've learned in any detail. But certain features seem worthy of summarizing. Overall, hydraulic fractures must be created in the right place to provide the extremely large new fracture surface area required for economic production of the extremely low permeability unconventional shales. They have to be connected and stay connected to the well bore to serve as a highway for oil and gas to flow to the surface. Understanding what the hydraulic fractures much, must accomplish isn't rocket science, but doing it certainly is rocket science. Before I begin with what we have learned, I want to review two things, a little bit of the state of the art in the background. First is a recent review of where we are regarding unconventional shales in a broad perspective, the state of the art. These bar charts are for five different plays over five years, 15 to 
2020. The two left bar charts show early well production and pounds of profit both normalized per foot of lateral. The bar chart and the table on the right show lateral links and well spacing. Again, all this information is for the past five years. These are averages from the Delaware, Midland, Bakken, Scoopsack, and Eagleford plays. These data were put out in August of this year, so it's recently put out by uh, the reference shown at the bottom. Well production shown in the upper left is early well production, 90-day early production average year by year in barrels per day per lateral foot. The top bar for 2020 is about 670 barrels per day average. Profit is shown in pounds per lateral foot in the bottom left bar chart. For 2020, the top bar is about 1,950 pounds of profit per foot of lateral. From 2019 to 20, well production increased 4%, but profit increased about 7%, both per foot of lateral. The title of the article, in fact, was Double Digit Year Over Year Production Games May Be Over. Lateral length shown in the right bar chart increased about 4% from 19 to 20. The top bar for 2020 is about 9,000 feet. I note, however, that recently there have been so much longer laterals noted in the premium, 15,000 feet or so. Well spacing shown in feet in the table, 2019 and 2020, it's not over five years, but only for 2019, 2020. Well spacing has moved a little closer in some cases, a little further apart in some cases. These are averages again for the five plays. This is an indication of where we are in terms of production, profit, lateral lengths, well spacing. The second thing I want to show as background is electricity production in the U.S. over the last 50 years. This is not a projection, this is fact. It's worth noting because oil and gas, and particularly unconventional shale gas, plays such a big role, far bigger than solar or wind or anything else except coal. In 2020, for example, about 40% of all U.S. electricity was produced from natural gas. This year, in 2021, it'll probably be a little more than 40% of all the electricity produced will be from natural gas. The takeaways from this plot are that over the last few years, say the last three or four years, coal electricity is decreasing. We've heard a lot about that. Nuclear and hydroelectricity are about constant, with both likely to decrease as some nuclear plants are decommissioned and drought conditions in the West will reduce hydroelectricity. Other, at the very top, is primarily solar electricity. It's been about constant. That, that was a surprise to me, but solar watt hours produced year over year is about constant over the past couple of years. And the big changes are the increase in wind electricity and in natural gas electricity. One must keep in mind that this is watt hours of electricity produced. It's not kilowatts or megawatts of installed capacity. It's the actual electricity generated. In addition to the 50 year observation, it's worth noting that Recently, electricity generation is changing a little bit back to coal and to oil, both in the U.S. and more so worldwide, because of the lack of availability of natural gas. This is certainly going in the wrong direction, considering the desire to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And it's headed in the wrong direction, even though coal is at the highest absolute price ever. Okay, what have we learned about hydraulic fracturing of the shales? We've learned a lot, but summarizing this is not easy, as I noted earlier. And to trying to summarize what we've learned, I chose to look at 11 focus areas, considering each alone. Looking at each alone was difficult enough, 
but how factual observations from looking at each individually would then work together is far more complicated than considering each focus area individually. There isn't time today to review all of the focus areas in detail, all 11 of them. And besides, that isn't needed in this brief overview. Instead, I want to highlight two broad areas, taking into account what is observed from the focus areas. The first is the hydraulic fracture created. When we considered hydraulic fractures created, the old saying, what goes around comes around, may well apply. Early, we considered a single planar vertical fracture and used the 3D fracture codes at that time, over two decades ago, to calculate this fracture, calibrating by correlating with pumping rate and the bottom hole injection pressure. But things didn't check out. We calculated way, way too long a fracture if we use the low permeability of the shales to estimate leak off. So we use very high leak off, like 70% or so, to reduce fracture lengths and to agree with pumping pressure than corresponding expected fracture width. This was done without understanding how such a high leak off worked. Laboratory tests on the shales showed that water imbibing into the shales over the pumping time of an hour or an hour and a half was more like eight or 10%, not 70%. I recall discussion, discussing this with Steve Holding. Steve quickly wrote down the eight to 10%, but we didn't know what was the difference between 70% needed in the codes and the measured eight or 10%. Microseismic measurements during fracturing began to be made and, and they suggested more of a complex fracture network, not a single planar fracture with a magic 70% leak off. Also, fracture, laboratory fracture tests on medium size and large scale blocks of shale meters, meter cube scale under high confinements further added to the 3D fracture network perception. This schematic shows in red how fractures might propagate in a shale sample with natural fractures shown schematically as the white parallel lines at an oblique angle. It shows what was observed in the log, large block tests for a different horizontal stress contrast. The, laboratory, average, uh, the early laboratory large scale tests, meter cubes, suggested quite different fractures would occur depending on the rock fabric and in situ stresses. And the fractures formed were complex, not a single fracture. They were a fracture network. This schematic I presented at an AAPG meeting in 2013. I think maybe Dr. Gong Han was the organizer, if I recall. The large scale laboratory observations seemed logical. The complicated shale rock fabric, including natural fractures and layers, would compete with their block stresses in guiding the fracture advance. At this AAPG meeting, uh, Dr. Norm Warpinski spoke just after me. I was the first speaker and Norm spoke second. Norm had on one of his slides something to the effect, natural fractures don't affect the hydraulic fracture growth. Norm and I had coffee together at the break and we discussed this. Norm hadn't mentioned this in his talk, but it was on one of his slides. He said after my presentation and the large scale block test results that I presented, that he didn't want to make that comment that natural fractures didn't affect the fracture propagation. I now think that maybe Norm and I have lived long enough to see that maybe we were both right. I'll discuss this more a little later. Indeed, I have great respect for Norm Rapinski. Along with the medium size and large scale block tests on shales, many calculations were made showing how an advancing fracture might progress as it intersected a natural fracture or a layer interface. Certainly the thinking momentum was there to consider, conclude that the fracture network was 3D highly complex. 
At the time, we had the shale Lloyd's block tests under high confinement stresses at Terratec as proof, although mostly confidential client data. But we had had test results that caused us to think as we did. The micro seismic data were adding to the 3D fracture network belief, and the shale heterogeneity generally added to the 3D fracture network perception. About this time, Dr. Roberto Suarez said, fracturing is a competition, a fight, between the rock fabric and the in situ stresses. Sometimes the rock fabric wins, and sometimes the in situ stresses win. And I repeated this in presentations over a decade ago. But then with more thought and as more calculations became available and more field experience, questions emerged that were difficult to answer. For example, a big question was that a real case cemented and perforated wellbore, how does the fracture initiate and propagate near the wellbore, say within 50 feet or so from the wellbore? This was particularly difficult to understand for clusters with multi-shots, like 10 or 12 shots per cluster. The question emerged, does the fracture start axial, parallel to the wellbore, and then turn to align with the in-situ stresses? Or does the fracture start normal to the wellbore, align with the in-situ stresses from initiation? We saw both axial and normal fractures in the medium and large-scale block tests. This schematic is taken from a very recent, very nice recent paper presented at ERTEC last July by Schlumberger staff. And this schematic from the paper representing uh, their recent medium-sized blocks, very nice test. An axial fracture is shown in green, and a fracture normal to the wall more shown in blue in the schematic of a broken apart rock. Now we've seen this before, as I just noted, in Researchers are continuing to see this. The debate continues, which comes first, the axial fracture or the normal fracture? Why does one most often get both in laboratory block tests? Again, a very nice paper showing a number of medium-sized block tests under confinement that Dr. Quan Guao from Schlumberger sent me. When one considers the near wall bore, it should also be noted that fracture fluid velocities are very high in this region. With fluid emanating from the point entry and considering the high pumping rates, fluid friction pressure drop along the crate fracture is correspondingly high. And of course, fluid with propet complicates the understanding. Propet does more than just change the effective viscosity of the fracture fluid. We add to our near well bore unknowns. How does the early cluster breakdown work? How does it work pumping profit after a clear fluid pad is pumped? And more. Yes, today the near well bore fracture is still uncertain. Alex Chu seemed to be right. The more we know, the more we know we don't know. Considering further away from the very near fracture wellbore, calculations using robust 3D planar fracture codes, considering horizontal layers of different stiffnesses, toughness, and in situ stresses have been made. This is image, an image from a very good paper by uh, Don Soff and, and Roberto Suarez. These are, there are other calculations and other papers also I could show, but complicated fracture shapes result from multiple near fractures occurring, such as multiple shots in a single cluster or closely spaced clusters. Although details can't be seen in this slide taken from the paper, I know it's hard to see. The different multi-fracture patterns are presented in the paper. It's a very nice paper. What may be called stress shattering leads to the complicated patterns aided by the different layers with different rock properties. So calculations show how complex fractures could be formed. Advancing the understanding of the hydraulic fracture created, uh, created Conical Phillips conducted extensive core back tests and presented their results, I think, at ERTEC in 2017, as I recall. This slide is taken from that paper. And Conical Phillips has presented subsequent papers, said very good papers. <clears throat> 
This was really quite important, I believe. They showed what seemingly appeared to be parallel, closely spaced fractures, which were called fracture swarms. Other core-backed programs, particularly the U.S. Department of Energy field programs, have added further evidence of closely spaced parallel fractures. These field core-backed programs have been and are very interesting and are proving much information, providing much information. The core back observations have tended to be away from the well bore, however, 50 feet or more, and mostly substantially further from the well bore. Coring closer to the well bore poses risk, of course, of accidentally breaking into the well bore. But the core back data are very helpful. And some very recent field observations seem to show the hydraulic fractures cutting right across natural fractures. So, with this background, here is what I think exists. We have the wellbore connector region right around the wellbore, the perf through the casing, and the region a few feet away from the wellbore, erosion of the perf casing hole and the cement, and the rock occurs during fracking. I'm not sure about an axial fracture versus the normal fracture initiating. I believe this is an unknown. The wellbore connector region is what some refer to as the fluid flow tortuosity region around the wellbore. And then there is a near wellbore region where fracture fluid velocities are high, profit is carried and deposited in this region. The initial fracture in this region advances rapidly. Some might refer to this as a fracture propagating with a lot of energy. Fractures tend to be less affected by the rock fabric governed more by in situ stresses. In this region, the fracture tends to cut across rock fabric, such as natural fractures and layer interfaces. The region more agrees with Norm Wapinski's comment, natural fractures don't affect the, the new hydraulic fracture. Then there is a far wellbore region, geometric dispersion leads to slower fracture velocities where the rock fabric plays a stronger role in guiding the advancing fracture. These are likely mostly unpropped or minimally propped fractures in this region. The fracture network is complex, maybe 3D. Here the fracture network agrees with my comments and Roberto Suarez's comments of the competition of the rock fabric and the in situ stresses. We really saw this in the laboratory large block tests. Low injection rates led to fracture advance highly guided by the rock fabric. And the rock fabric becomes more dominant as, as horizontal stress contrast becomes low. So not only does the rock fabric play a stronger role, but the horizontal in situ stress contrast plays more of a role for regions of low injection rates. I might add, we saw this in large block tests even before the shales, when we were looking at tight sands, for example, the created fractures in the large blocks would wander around, guided by the rock fabric at very low injection rate. On the other hand, a rapid injection, which can sometimes be caused in the lab tests by the fracture fluid expansion due to decompression, for the rapid injection rates, the fracture rapidly progresses through the entire block, more cutting across the rock fabric. In a way, we had this interesting information, but maybe didn't fully appreciate it at the time. So considering the schematic of all with the different fracture regions, one would immediately ask, well, what about the multi-parallel fractures seen in the corebacks, like the conical Phillips fracture swarms, and more recent Department of Energy field coreback programs? They certainly exist. One could also ask, at what distances from the well bore will the advancing fracture cut across a natural fracture or a layer interface versus the fracture being arrested, branching, or bifurcate into two or more fractures as it intersects the rock's discontinuity? There is simply a lot of I don't knows here, but undoubtedly multi-parallel fractures and either cutting across rock fabric or not depends not only on the fluid injection rate and the fluid viscosity, effective viscosity,
but also on the rock fabric and the horizontal stress contrast. Ironically, the schematic above showing the well connected, the near well bore, and the far well bore regions came from a coalescing of ideas by Roberto Suez and me. And I presented this around 2010. As I said earlier here, what goes around comes around. One more thing I, I should add that the perception today seems to be toward more vertical and more planar fractures. Evidence tends to be more circumstantial with each individual having their prejudice leading to this perception. But less complex 3D fracture networks seem to have some logic as we have heard in past presentations. Maybe logical in the sense of the fractures of interest that are the super highways to allow oil and gas to travel the well more, maybe more vertical and more planar. We'll see on that one. Before leaving the subject of the fracture network created, I want to note one more thing. In the days of the underground nuclear tests at the US Nevada test site, effects nuclear tests after 1972 were mined back. The mine back made detailed investigations, including studying hydraulic fractures that might be created out of the cavity that was formed. The concern about hydraulic fractures was that a fracture might be formed and travel to the surface and allow radioactivity to escape into the atmosphere. I was involved in these tests and the mine backs were very extensive and most interesting. There were many of them. We noticed that mean normal stress also affected whether fractures would cut across rock discontinuities like natural fractures and layer interfaces. For high mean normal stresses, high confinements, the hydraulic fracture would cut right across discontinuities. And as the mean normal stress decreased with distance from the cavity wall, the rock fabric began to play a role. Of course, in the nuclear test, mean normal stresses could be very high near the cavity wall and then decrease away. For hydraulic fracturing of the unconventional shales, the change in mean normal stress isn't that great from well to well or even play to play. And so the effect of mean normal stress variations probably isn't important from well to well. However, in comparing laboratory bench tests, that is laboratory tests with little or no confinement to deep well conditions, mean normal stress effects are important in my opinion as to how the rock fabric affects fracture propagation. Indeed, the many Nevada test site mine backs were helpful to understand this. The second broad area I want to speak to besides the fracture network created has to do with fluid mobility. This isn't exactly on the subject of what have we learned about hydraulic fracture, but it's definitely related. Unconventional shale production decline rates are high and are relatively similar from play to play, irrespective of the fracture treatments. At first thought, this seems odd that the fracture treatment doesn't much affect the decline rates, but considering the laws of physics, this is logical. For example, one dimensional Darcy fluid flow through a porous media to a free surface shows decline rate directly related to permeability. The lower the permeability, the higher the decline rate. So for the conventional shales where the rock matrix gas perm of a nano Darcy or so, and a reservoir gas perm may be hundreds to a thousand nano Darcy's, the decline rate should be high. The shales, of course, are much more complicated than one dimensional gas flow. We're dealing with relative permeabilities, with saturation change, with mixed wettabilities, with fluid phase changes, with rock matrix change like clay swelling due to frack water and more that occurs. Nevertheless, decline rates are closely linked to the reservoir relative permeability, or maybe more correctly, reservoir fluid mobility. I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but have thought much about what can one do to enhance reservoir fluid mobility? What can we do to change the fluid mobility throughout the reservoir? 
unfortunately, not much. It's not possible to move fluid molecules through the impermeable shales like a conventional oil, water flood or chemical flood or carbon dioxide sweep through the reservoir. There are chemicals that could be considered to enhance shale fluid mobility, but considerations stop as one addresses, how do you get this fluid into the reservoir away from the fracture face? The things we can do is drill and fracture, which is what is done. Maybe one could drill more and frack less, but overall drilling and fracture treatments are what is done. What else could be done? We can shake the reservoir, seismic stimulation. That's not a new idea and has been deployed with very limited success for conventional oil, particularly oil with a high water cut. You can move electrons through the reservoir, electromagnetic waves. That was considered in the 1970s energy crisis with the effect of either heating the fluids or heating the reservoir and lowering fluid effective viscosities or in some cases, electroplating clay platelets occurs, thereby changing permeability, but without much commercial success to my knowledge. Some work has considered chemical ions that could favorably change wettability with the intent that ions could be moved at least somewhat into the reservoir, maybe driven by electromagnetic methods that, as has been demonstrated in the medical field. But let me get back to the topic of this overview, hydraulic fracturing. Agreeing that to reduce the decline rates requires improving reservoir fluid mobility. At present, we can try to create more reservoir contact by creating more hydraulic fracture surface area. More hydraulic fracture surface area also is the route to increasing recovery factors. However, creating more hydraulic fracture surface area is not a free lunch. Creating more fracture surface area can lead to more fracture-driven interactions, FDIs, where the fracture fluid is exchanged from an advancing fracture into an already existing created fracture, or frac hits, a form of FDIs, where hydraulic fracture intersects another well. Ali Donashe suggests managing FDIs the next frontier, and he and George King, Dr. George King, have worked on this as, uh, as, as are others. This may get managed, as George King noted not too long ago, by the tried and proven method of trial and error. When we began at Teratech to work on early 3D planar fracture codes in the late 1970, and it was really Professor Rodney Clifton of Brown University that led this effort for Teratech. Professor Clifton said to me, Sid, there are some problems that are just too difficult to calculate, and this might be one of them. Maybe applying what Rod Clifton said relative to calculating hydraulic fractures is right on. And maybe what George King noted is very appropriate. Both of these individuals are indeed, of course, very smart individuals. In closing, I want to look at the subject. In closing, the subject was what have we learned about hydraulic fracturing of the unconventional shale? We've learned a lot, as I said at the beginning. And we're learning more every day, particularly with new measurement techniques available and big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to manage and use the amounts of data. But maybe the most valuable takeaway here today is what have we not learned? We are still wrestling with what is the fracture network created? We've pretty much gone full circle on this from a single planar fracture, vertical fracture with very high leak off to a complex 3D fracture network resulting from the rock fabric to maybe today more planar vertical fractures, at least closer to the well bore. But for sure, a fracture network is created, not a single fracture emanating from each cluster. And even more complicated is the final propped connected fracture created. We don't understand the near wellbore fracturing, whether fractures start axial or parallel to wellbore and then turn to align with situ stresses, or whether fractures immediately start novel to wellbore, immediately aligning with the situ stresses.
nor do we understand how even and uneven injection is in each cluster. Although new fiber optics data is really helping to understand this, I believe. I believe these measurements are real breakthroughs. We don't know how to manage and are working on fracture-driven interactions where the hydraulic fracture intersects an already existing fracture or another nearby well. Far field divergence concepts and application is new, along with fiber optics measurements aimed at managing pumping, both to manage FDIs. We haven't learned where the propent goes, like 20 million pounds in a single well. Where does the propent go? This is a big question. After all, it's not just the fracture network that is crucial. It's the propped and connected fracture network that counts most, which I repeat over and over. Propped transport, propped bridging, propped settling are today more estimated by conjecture and experience than by science, I would argue. Maybe the bottom line is two things. First, we have not learned how to greatly increase the recovery factor. We know that most of the oil and gas is still left in place. Recovery factor has to be about the fracture network, getting the propped connected fracture network throughout the reservoir. Refracturing sounds logical to open another region in the reservoir to be drained. Unfortunately, geomechanics tells us that's difficult to get the refracture in the right place. Nevertheless, recovery factor must be about the fracture network. Second, we have not learned how to reduce the rapid production decline rates. Decline is tied to reservoir permeability, or maybe more correctly, reservoir fluid mobility, as I said before. That's not exactly hydraulic fracture issue, but hydraulic fracturing is the way we have today of intersecting the reservoir. I've been promoting for the last few years that we need a big change in fracking as bold as horizontal drilling and stage fracking itself to make improvements, big improvements, in recovery factor and decline rates. And I've been arguing that won't happen unless we think out of the box, think quite different. How do we increase the recovery factor, reduce the decline rate? Unfortunately, the environment hasn't been conducive for this. And now we're in a position of 40% or maybe more of US electricity is from natural gas that is highly dependent on hydraulic fracturing. And world capex for oil and gas E&P is not enough, in my opinion, to provide the oil the world will need in the immediate years ahead, something of the order of 100 million barrels a day, for at least a while, no matter what energy transition is projected. I haven't stopped in my consideration of what do we learn, uh, Mark Pearson said it would be a daunting task, and it is. But the value created from what we have learned, of course, is really in a, the application of what we have learned. To that end, understanding just what have been learned is critical and is a first step in creating value. Finally, what industry has accomplished in drilling and completing the unconventional shale wells is absolutely amazing, as I noted in the beginning of my presentation. The efficiency improvements have been and continue to be spectacular. It's been driven by economics. Economic incentive really works. As I said in the beginning, this is one perspective, it's mine. But I want to extend thanks to my collaborators. Uh, I mentioned already Dr. Mark Pearson, you know, a person with great knowledge and wisdom and and uh, really helpful in questions. Professor John McLennan here at the University of Utah. John and I have many discussions together and, and uh, John McLennan is, is great to work with and to talk to. Dr. Roberto Suez at the Van Gotten Laboratory. Roberto, uh, I've known for a long time. He was, I believe, Neville Cook's last or next to last student and very tremendous geomechanics background along with great shale oil gas recovery experience. And Professor Derek Ellsworth at Penn State. I really enjoy my interactions with Derek Ellsworth. A recent email, he noted that, Sid, I agree with some of your conclusions. I took that as something very good. Anyway, thanks much to my collaborators for the talk.